how are you? Good. So, uh, a little bit about me. I was uh, raised within the Shambhala Buddhist tradition. I'm a student of Sakyang Mipam Rinpoche, who Mar- Marianne just uh, referenced. I've been teaching meditation for the last 12 years, and as Emily just mentioned, I, I'm the author of a few books. And if you actually heard that title, The Buddha Walks Into a Bar, and you thought, who the heck is this guy, and why is he up here? And you have that healthy sense of skepticism, I want to encourage that. <laughs> That's actually going to be a big part of what we're going to be talking about today as we review the role of the teacher in the 21st century. Um, so, we get the perfect. Um, this is the bragging portion of the presentation. I just got back from a few weeks over in Europe. I was in Sarzo, France for a period of time. And this is me working right off the ocean. This is me bragging. Um, <laughs> I was over there, and I was staying with a friend. And he's lovely, except I don't know a lick of French at all. And he only armed me with one phrase for the nine days I was there, which is, Je suis Spiderman. <laughs> As you can imagine, this got very difficult if I went to market. <laughs> I would want some artichokes. All I could say is, yes, we speed a man. <laughs> For those of you who haven't figured out, it means I am Spider-Man. <laughs> um, for the sake of really classing up this conference, I would love it if we could all say this together. Yes, we speed a man. Thank you. And I mention this because we are all Spider-Man. And I will explain why. Spider-Man, for those of you who are not familiar was a teenager who was bitten by a radioactive spider and as a result gained incredible agility, super strength, the ability to walk on walls, a sense that would go off when he was faced with danger. And at first, he was a charlatan. At first, he used his powers for his own self-gain. And then something happened. He witnessed a robbery. And he very easily could have stopped it, but didn't because he didn't think it had anything to do with him. That robber ran out, found a car, pulled open the door, shot a man dead, stole the car, sped off. Spider-Man, in his Peter Parker persona, man of, uh, rises, comes out of the building, looks down, sees his Uncle Ben dead, the man who raised him. And he s- runs after the man who killed his Uncle Ben, only to find <laughs> that it's the same person he could have stopped says, that face, it can't be. It's the same fugitive who ran past me, and I didn't stop him when I had the chance. And it's at that moment that Peter Parker realizes he has to do something that his Uncle Ben imparted to him as part of his last words, which were, with great power comes great responsibility. That is why I wanted to talk about Spider-Man today, because I believe we are all Spider-Man. I believe we all actually wield great power in this interconnected age. What is that power? That power is the fact that we have these tools to reach more people than we ever had in any previous generation. Right? We know this. Now, if you're like me, you've gone on some sort of meditation retreat, and you come home, and your friends say, so what was that like exactly? What were you doing? And essentially, what they're asking is, like, was that worth it? (laughs) Right? And you might say, well, you know, I really, I was meditating all the time and I got to know my mind better. Or um, we did all of our meals in a contemplative manner and it's really helped me appreciate how I eat. Or we were in silence for long periods of time and it made me very aware of how I use my speech. And in that moment, what you are doing is you are communicating your understanding of the Dharma or the teachings of the Buddha. You are communicating your experience, ideally in a genuine way. And in that moment, you are a teacher. You may not be a teacher with a capital T. You may not have a a land center out in the middle of Wyoming that you all of a sudden start attracting all these hundreds of thousands of students to. But you are in that role, communicating the Dharma, in my mind, being a teacher. Now, in today's world, it's not, that's, you know, 20 years ago, that's basically how we would do this sort of thing. Now, do we have anyone here who is a blogger? Any bloggers in the room? Yeah. You guys have incredible power. You guys have incredible responsibility. Um, The Dharma is out there, folks. These days, if you want to practice meditation, do you go to your yellow pages and look up your meditation center? No. You go to Google. (laughs) And you type in meditation in your city, and maybe a meditation center comes up, or maybe a blog comes up. 
And this is a, a list that I pulled from Full Contact Enlightenment. It was on the sidebar. It was a blog roll. And I couldn't even fit all of those on this page. And there are, of course, millions more. And they're all very different. We have Buddhist geeks, which is obviously very different than um, Angry Asian Buddhist, <laughs> which is very different than Reverend Danny Fisher. These uh, blogs all have their own particular take on how to present the teachings and what matters in Buddhism and Buddhism in America today. I want to pick on one of them to illustrate this fact that when you post, put something out on the internet, or you do a podcast, or you do something of that manner, that your post can actually reach hundreds of thousands of people, and that is a wonderful and horrible thing at the same time. I'm going to pick on the Interdependence Project. I'm allowed to. I write for them. Um, and they have a great mix of people that work with them. They have people who have studied and practiced the Dharma for decades and in a conventional sense have been authorized as teachers within a specific Buddhist tradition and maybe they've written books, maybe they are considered experts in a certain field, people like Tara Brock, Susan Piver, and then they also have people who have been meditating for two weeks and they're also blogging for them. And in this particular space, if you stumble across the Interdependence Project site, you get both and they have the similar reach. I think that's really fascinating. This is sort of the equaling of the playing field in terms of who's presenting the Dharma. And it's interesting that on this site they have an equal reach because I can't imagine that the greatest Buddhist teachers in the 13th century sitting there in Tibet would ever hope that their teachings would be able to reach the number of people that that person who's been practicing for two weeks just did. That's fascinating, right? That is the power that we have in today's world. And to take it down even from a step further, there's this thing called Twitter. I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> this is a tweet by my teacher, Sakyang Mipam Rinpoche. It's a quote from his book, The Shambhala Principle. It says, aggression is a sign not of strength, but of fear, failure, and weakness. One quote from a book that you know, just came out a few months ago. I don't imagine that sold more than 20,000 copies, but here we have it retreated 37 times, and that quote has reached more people immediately, not including, of course, the 10,000 people that are following him alone. So this is the power of the internet. Whenever we put something out there, we are communicating the Dharma. We may not necessarily think we are a teacher or that we are wielding incredible power, but in some sense, that's what's going on. So that's the power side, that we have the ability to reach thousands of people very easily. I want to get on to the responsibility side, because with great power comes this great responsibility. I don't want to make it sound like I was against these people who have been practicing for two weeks putting their understanding out there. I think it's great. I think it's great that we all do that. I think, in fact, it's needed. We need to share these precious teachings. The world, as Marianne just very aptly showed is suffering in a myriad of ways. And I'm a firm believer that these teachings can help alleviate suffering. So we should be getting them out there. The important thing is that we get them out there in a genuine way. And we get them out there to as many different types of people as possible. And I feel like I'm something of the opening act for Kate Johnson, and I'm really glad that she's giving the talk that she is on diversity, because the Dharma is not just for us, right? It's for everyone. It is for people from all socioeconomic backgrounds from people for all sexual orientations, people who come from all different races. It is for everyone. That is what we really need to make clear in our heads. It's not just us talking to our friends and people who are exactly like us anymore. We have the ability to reach all sorts of people, and we should take advantage of that. But we have to do it well. We have to be genuine. We have to be genuine when we go out and communicate our understanding of the Dharma. We shouldn't try and sound smart. We shouldn't try and make ourselves into the best, most authoritative teacher with a capital T. We should be the best at communicating our experience. So I want to offer a few tools in terms of my own experience of trying to communicate the Dharma genuinely. This is a pretty traditional framework. Listen, contemplate, meditate. I'm sure many of you guys have heard of it before. You hear the Dharma. You listen to it. You study it. You talk about it with your friends, and you have dialogues around it. That's one part of it. Then we meditate. 
We bring the Dharma into our experience. We make it a part of ourselves. Sorry, I skipped contemplate. That we actually bring it into our conceptual understanding of how does this mesh with my experience? How does this actually relate to what I have gone through? So this is sort of a unique listen, contemplate, meditate. Ultimately, it becomes a part of who we are. It's not a theory anymore. And then, um, not to mess with the traditional structure, I also threw an integrate because I feel like it's also implied. This is the unspoken fourth aspect. That once we have been able to embody a certain understanding of the Dharma into our being, we integrate that into the rest of our lives. And I often say that meditation practice is a really interesting term, right? Because you could say, I practice guitar, or I practice a sport. You're practicing for something. With meditation practice, we are practicing for the rest of our lives. All of the waking hours that we are not on the meditation cushion, we are practicing being present, kind, compassionate individuals as we relate with others. So that's the integrate aspect. And um, that's the framework I want to work in. There's two other aids I want to mention. One is this gentleman, obviously, sort of taking up the majority of that screen. That is Sakyang Mipam Rinpoche. That's my teacher. Um, and I think the importance of having a teacher, and it doesn't have to be a root teacher or guru like this, it could be an elder, it could be a spiritual friend, but someone that you emulate and can work with and a community that will support you so that you're not doing this alone. And, um, you know, within the traditional framework of people saying that they take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, people say, I like the Buddha, right? I get the Buddha. He was a smart guy. The Dharma, these teachings make sense to me. Why the heck do I have to take on the Sangha? They're jerks. Um, <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, I feel that way myself sometimes. But having a Sangha, having a community, and having someone in particular that you work with regularly, look up to, and emulate is important in supporting your path. The other flip side of this that I always think is interesting has been a lot of my own path is the path of making mistakes, where, you know, at certain points, because we are so interconnected, because we have such power, we may make a mistake. We may let the robber sneak by us. And ideally, it won't cause as much harm as it did for poor Peter Parker. But we will make mistakes over time. There's a practice within Vajrayana Buddhism known as Vajrasattva. Vajrasattva practice is a visualization practice. And uh, without going too far in depth about it, it's a pro uh, process where you bring to mind transgressions or mistakes that you have made, you offer yourself a sense of forgiveness having acknowledged them, and you resolve not to do them again. So however your mistakes may manifest, um, this is me going to extremes, we've got some pink handcuffs, <laughs> smoking multiple cigarettes at once, some moonshine, and even some rat poison, or as I like to call it, a good Saturday night. Um, <laughs> whatever your particular vice may be, hopefully it is not rat poison, um, <laughs> When you go to extremes, when you do make mistakes, we have to resolve not to do them and then come back to the path. So when we notice that we've diverged, we come back over and over again. That is a big part of what we need to do, that we learn from whatever mistakes come about. When we actually do this, when we actually wield our power, our interconnected uh, ability to reach out to thousands and thousands of people in a way that is in line with our own experience, then we're actually being of benefit to others. Then we're genuinely explaining our understanding of the Dharma. And not through logical means. And we live in a cerebral world. We don't have, live in a world where society constantly whispers in our ear and it's like, you should be more heartfelt. You should be more open-hearted, right? That's not necessarily the direction society has gone in most recently. So we have to be conscious that when people do arise, or we start to arise as teachers with a capital T in we start to act out for personal gain. We start to act out so that we look good, so that we sound good, so that people like us, whatever it might be. We rein that in. We don't do that again. We come back to our own understanding and our integration of the Dharma in our being. And it's our responsibility to not be those charlatans, to not be those... Um, this comes full circle to thinking, you know, is this guy charlatan? Uh, we have to be genuine and humble and share our experience, not our theoretical knowledge. Then we are actually benefit to people because our communication is genuine. There's a story 
of a Kagyu lineage holder, one of the great teachers of uh, Tibetan Buddhism known as Naropa. Naropa was a very, very smart man. And he was a great scholar. And one day he was out reading, and this old woman approached him. And she said, what you reading there? And he told her. And she said, do you understand the words of what you're reading? And he said, yes, actually, yes, I do. And she was overjoyed. She started, she picked up her cane, she was swinging it, and she was laughing, and she was so happy. And then she turned to him and she said, do you understand the meaning of those words? And thinking he could make her equally happy, he said, yes. Yes, I understand the meaning. And she started crying. She was beyond uh, consolation. She was just sobbing and sobbing. And he said, what's wrong? What What happened? She said, when you told me that you understood the words, I knew you were telling the truth. When you said you understood the meaning, I knew you were lying. And this propelled Naropa down his spiritual path where he realized that he had to integrate the teachings into his being. That's what we need to do. That's, we need to move beyond not the words, but the meaning of the Dharma. We need to know our meaning, our experiential meaning, in order to be of the most benefit to others. And frankly, ladies and gentlemen, the world needs this, as I mentioned before. They need these teachings. They need our understanding, our experiential understanding. And we can use the power of the internet and meeting one-on-one or in groups with people if we can do it responsibly, if we're well-trained and we embody these teachings in kindness and compassion. The world is very much in need of some sanity. So if we have some sanity to offer, we should do that. So I hate to do these sorts of things and not have a dialogue after. I'm on the twitter.com at this, hashtag, at this uh, username. I'm also reachable through my website. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, you can talk to my You can read the books. I actually have copies if people are interested. And there's these blue cards out there. And I brought them with me. And my publisher would kill me if I didn't mention that there's a code there that says that you can get 30% off the next book (laughs) if you go to their website. So thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. And I hope that we all work together to utilize our power very responsibly.